In this video, we show how to install and configure a new Unix agent. It's quite long because a few steps are required to set this up properly. We are starting with a fully operational automation engine and show how to install the agents on a Unix system that was added to the environment. The procedure requires specific steps and we recommend you follow them closely and in sequence. We create a directory for the installation of the agent. We have a dedicated user who owns the directory, which should not belong to root. We make this user the owner of the agent directory. Then we show how to configure the agents prior to startup with the INI file. We install the right agents based on the flavor, distribution, and system level using the executable. We then start the agents. We run a sleep job to test and make sure the agent is working. And finally, we add the new agent to the service manager so as to stop and start this agent remotely without having to do so locally or manually. In order for the agent to operate properly, some system level configuration is required. We have a user, user1, who starts the agent. We're going to install the agent in the dedicated directory. In our case, it will be slash opt slash atomic. User1 needs to be the owner of that directory. Given the agent's operational requirements, we have to change the ownership and mode of the agent file so that root owns it and it remains executable. Before we start the agent, as for any atomic automation components, we need to update the agent's configuration file. There's quite a bit of information in the file, but we focus on three specific items, namely the agent name, which can be different from the host name, the atomic system name, as it was defined when the engine was installed, and the engine host name, so that the agent is able to communicate with the engine over a CP process. We also check the process port. For the sake of clarity, we start with two systems. The green background is a Windows system called WinAAM, which has the automation engine, which is fully functional. The other computer is a brand new Linux system in the environment called LXAAM. We install the Unix agent on this system. It's assumed that the systems are networked, resolve each other's names, and have a shared directory where we can copy files. We strongly advise against using IP addresses in our configuration files. It's just not a good idea. On the WinAM green system, we find the installation package, which was downloaded from our download center. It contains a directory called Agents with a series of subdirectories that contain the appropriate agent package. Through a shared drive, we're able to access the zip package from the Linux system. We copy the package to the user's home directory and documents on the orange LXAAM system. We copy the package based on the distribution and system level. The package is a GZ zip file. Using non-standard tools you are comfortable with is understandable. However, we want to keep this demo non-specific, using a conventional approach and basic commands like VI, so it will work with most flavors of Unix. First, we connect as root so we're able to work in slash opt and install the agents. Let's create a directory for the agents. The recommended naming convention is slash opt slash atomic slash agents but we can use anything we want. We copy the agent package from the user's documents directory to the newly created agent directory. We can now uncompress the agent package. For this, we use the gunzip command.
The result is a tar archive file. We extract the archive using tar XVF. We've extracted the archive and we now have a number of directories. The two we focus on are the bin directory, which contains the agent executable and configuration INI file, and temp, which contains the logs generated by the agent in the case of malfunctions. We navigate to bin. In the bin directory, we find two files. The first is the agents. To find it, consider all the executable files. The one that does not end in S or M is the agents. The other is the agents INI configuration file. We consider the INI next. Its name should be the same as the agents, but with the INI extension. So we rename it with the move command. This is the result we want. As stated earlier, we have two files. Executing the file starts the agents. The INI file contains the configuration data necessary to connect to the automation engine. Let's configure this file before starting the agents. Without this configuration, the agent will start fine, but will be unable to communicate with the engine. There's quite a bit in this file, but for our purposes, we focus on the connection details. We need to configure the agent name as it will be known in the automation environments and can be different from the host name. The system name, which should be common to all components and was defined when the engine was first installed, and the name of the host where the engine was installed, along with the port of the communication process. We search for CP equals. We replace CP host with the name of the host on which the engine is installed. The agent is now properly configured and ready to be started. Before we proceed with starting the agents, let's configure ownership and mode. First, the agent's installation directory needs to belong to our dedicated user, and second, the agent executable itself needs to belong to roots and be executable. First, let's change the ownership of the directory of the user. We set the ownership of the agent to roots. Finally, we change the agent's mode to 4755. This means it is readable and executable by anyone, but can only be edited by the owner. We can now start the agents. As soon as this happens, the web interface of Atomic Automation notifies us that the agent is started and is communicating. We receive a yellow message notification. The message informing us that the host is now active is a sure sign that everything is working as it should. In Client 0, in the administration perspective, we see the agent in the list, which has a check mark in the authenticated column. Let's consider some of the basic functions associated with an agent. We are in the administration perspective of Client 0. We open the new agent. By default, the agent is configured to be authorized for Client 100. If you have more clients configured, you can add the agent to those by enabling authorizations. This can be left blank. We will add the agent to the service manager, but we'll do so in the manager itself. 
you have the option of stopping an agent from client zero. The surest way to establish that the agent is working is to run some sort of dummy job. We start in client 100 and process assembly. To run a job, the agent requires its own login object to authenticate the system user and allow it to execute batch processes on the system. We create the object and assign it to the agent. Then we create the job and add a sleep command with a 40 second parameter. We then execute the job. If it runs and completes normally, the agent is working. We add the agent to the service manager so as to control it remotely. Atomic Automation requires the service manager to be installed on every single host where an agent is installed. A service manager dialog can then connect to any service manager in the environment and start and stop processes. The service manager is not in scope for this video. Therefore, behind the scenes, we have installed a service manager on the agent system. We only show how to configure. First, we need to update the service manager definition file on the agent host. We add the command in the SMD file and then restart the service manager process. Next, we update the service manager dialog INI file on the engine host, since this is where we're controlling operations. We add the new host to the config file and we're good to go. To be clear, the engine has a service manager which controls all the processes on that host and is therefore irrelevant to this video. It also has a service manager dialog, which is a basic interface to control the service manager. The dialog is multi-host. It can connect to any Windows or Unix system in the environment, provided a separate service manager process is running on that system. The dialog is of special interest. We want to use it to connect to a service manager we have installed on the agent host to control the agents. So, on the agent host, we configure the service manager so it's able to control the agent process. Then on the agent host, we configure the dialog so it is able to connect to the agent host. To make a process manageable by the service manager, we update its SMD file. The agent is a subservice we added to the manager with the define uc4 command. We name the agent and then point to the agent file and its path. The easiest way to do this is to grab the define command from the engine smd file, copy it here, and simply change the agent name. In order for this change to take effect, we need to restart the service manager Unix process. We find the service manager process ID with PSEF and kill it. Then we restart it as the dedicated user.
We now update the Service Manager dialog on the engine host. We add the new host to the dialog INI file. In doing so, we make it possible for the dialog to connect to the new host. Note that the Service Manager connection is not secure because we did not configure security. This wasn't the purpose of this video, but it still works fine. We're able to control the agents. In Properties, you'll have the option of setting the Agent Start to Automatic. When the Agent System is restarted, the Agent starts automatically. Here, we just start and stop the Agent from the dialog.